I am thankful to be able to preach the word to you all today. How many believe that the word of God is the supreme authority for all matters of faith and conduct? How many believe that in the house today? That the word of God is the supreme authority over all matters of faith and conduct. Why? Why is it? Because God is the author of it. Because in the beginning, there was God and he is the author of the word of God. And so we think about in society, right? We have so many experts. There's an expert over this. There's an expert over that. We have love doctors. We have engineering experts. We have nutritious experts, right? If you hurt a certain part of your body, if you just hurt your ankle, you can go to a doctor that specializes in ankle surgery and rehab. What does that mean? That means he spent about a decade or so studying how to rehabilitate an ankle and he has a certain level of expertise. Well, in God, in one being resides all of the wisdom of all ages. All expertise resides in this being and he created the world and everything in it. This is why the word of God is the supreme authority over everything because God created his earth. And if you want to learn how to live in it, to maneuver through it, and you guys know life is hard. Relationships are hard. Serving God is hard. Walking with God is hard. If you want to know how to maneuver through it, if you want to streamline that process, this is why we come to the word of God. This is why we take opportunities to hit sit and hear people lead the conversation when it comes to what is on the mind of God and what is in the word of God. Amen. 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 All right. I'm gonna let y'all know right now. I want y'all to talk back to me. Now I'm from South Georgia. When I say amen, y'all should, I want to hear it. Amen. 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 Well, praise God. We're not going to waste any time. We're going to go ahead and get into the word of God. If you were turning your Bibles to Psalms chapter five, Psalms chapter five, and we're going to be in two verses, verses 11 and 12 that we're going to discuss today. And it says, but let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you. For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor, you will surround him as with a shield. Amen. Let's pray before the Lord. Lord, we just thank you, God, for this opportunity. God, we want nothing more but to know your way. Please, God, teach us your way. Father, I would pray that you would just allow me to be a vessel of awakening, a vessel, a quickening, a vessel that can quicken the souls and the minds of your people, God. You know, Lord, as we are walking this walk, it gets tough sometimes. It gets hard sometimes. But God, we know that there is life in you and there is life in your word, Father. Christ Jesus, would you come and walk amongst us with you, with will, will you in your majesty and your character and your being, would you come and sit down and be with us so that we can move beyond religiosity, God? We want to move beyond routine because if you come into the place, God, it'll take us beyond those things that we just kind of pattern to do. So God, meet us in this word. Meet, Help us, God, to just leave here changed. We don't want to go the same way we've come. We've done that so many times, God, and we believe that in you there is life. So quicken us through this word, quicken us through this fellowship. God, we look to you and pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 You all may be seated. Now, I don't know about you as far as the heading in your Bibles, but above my chapter for Psalm chapter five, it actually says a morning prayer. 
This is a morning prayer, and it says that the, it's to the chief musician with flute. So this is a, pray, a prayer that David prayed in the morning, and it just really connects back to last week. Remember, Pastor Max brought a word, and it was on prayer. It talked about prayer, prayer uh, being personal and not publicity, uh, prayer being practical and not prestigious, prayer that prepares and, and does it prescribes. And then we see David going to God in the morning to pray. David back in Old Testament times, waking up, David is a king and he's waking up in the morning and he says, this is the song. And, and if you really think about the beauty of David singing his prayer, that is a, that's an intimate worship. And David knew the power of prayer. And, and in my Bible, it says that he went to him in the morning. Now, I have a routine that I do every single day. Some of my, my partners, Cam, Sean, especially my wife, can tell you for years I get up and I do the same thing. I've, I've eaten the same thing really for years at lunch. People that know me at my job and, and I'm in education, I'm a principal, they know. People that know me, I'm going to have my jug of water and they know for lunch he's going to eat some little slop of chili that he makes himself. That's every single day for years since I was a teacher here in Houston, Texas. Now, obviously... On the weekend, I do some other things because <laughs> I would be as small as a pole if I just stuck to that. But there is this routine. And so I wake up most mornings around 3.30 or 4. And most times when I wake up, you know, I, I kind of make my way through the bathroom. I make my way into our closet and I sit down. And, and I'm supposed to be putting on my shoes, getting ready to get prepared to go work out. But a lot of times I'm just in the closet. Yeah. And I'm just sitting there, my legs are crossed, and I know I'm, so, I'm tired, but I'm thinking thoughts. And you would be amazed at some of the thoughts that, are, that come in my head. Sometimes I get emotional. I want to cry. It seems like the worst thoughts, the worst anxiety, the worst types of depressions hit me in the morning. But see, I've been walking with the Lord for some time, and so I know now after I started this routine to not even take myself serious in the morning. Like I've gotten to the point that even though I'm sitting there and I'm, I mean, sometimes my eyes water, sometimes I'm emotional. I don't even know why I'm emotional, but I've learned to really. And then there's been times where I've just really shook myself out of it. I've said, what, man, what are you thinking? Get up, man, put you you're here to work out. Like I've taken myself out of that thought pattern and I've moved on into my routine and why do I say that because mornings are rough like I don't care I, as one piece of practical advice don't take yourself serious with any thought that cross your mind before six o'clock because it's rough and there are there are times most times that the enemy would take advantage of that period of time in the morning like he'll see that there's this struggle and a lot of the struggle is really physiological you just hadn't your body hadn't woke up your oxygen your blood ain't flowing and that really shows as well the connection between the mind and the spirit and the body there is a connection sometimes we try to isolate just the spiritual things but there is a connection if you want spiritual health well you have to give some type of thought and credence to the physical health are you sometimes when we struggle with depression and struggle with our emotions sometimes we're not drinking enough water yes. now will the enemy take advantage of our lack of discipline and 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 ride that wave to amplify it, you better believe he will because he's very he's a, str a strategian he definitely will take advantage of it but in the mornings i'm struggling so now i know i don't take myself serious i just kind of jump up in the morning but david david in his struggle david had to go through and experience the same type of morning struggle because he woke up and he went to pray David says, now what do I need to do? When I wake up in the morning, it seems like my mind is in a bad place. David knew his response to this warfare in his mind was to go set his mind on things above. So I say to you that prayer is spiritual and it's practical. 
Because in prayer, as we set our mind, so my mind is on a thousand things that during the day I don't even think about. But it's only in that morning time. And we know when you stay up too late. Amen. Amen. You get to staying up too late, right? You get past 12 and the one, two. Man, your mind start wandering off into some things. I used to tell my wife, I said, look, when you go to bed, I go to bed. Like when you get ready to wrap yourself up and you saying you're going to bed, like don't leave me downstairs. Like I ain't got no what I'm down there for. If I got something I want to do, I'm going to do it upstairs with you. Amen. Amen. So she'll do that. She'll take because just in living life, you understand like this is just not wise for me because I'm vulnerable nighttime and in the morning. David had a practical. He knew that the practical way to negate the struggle of the mind at its weakest point was to pray to God. And we see here in this passage that David prayed for joy. David's prayer in the morning was, God, give me joy. Now, there's a lot of things that David could have prayed for. He definitely could have prayed for strength because as we see all throughout the Psalms, they were after him. They was after his tail because he had enemies galore. People was seeking to, to, to take his life. But David prayed for joy. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to talk about the joy of salvation, that there is joy to be had that's built upon prayerful trust in God's word. And it has fruit that gives us that thing that we want more in life, which is consistency in our walk with God. So Psalms chapter five, joy, and I want this, this is the sticking point. Joy is rooted and nurtured through trust in Christ's word and has fruit that creates the consistency we desperately want and need and it's expressed in grateful praise. We want to have consistency. There's three points that I want to bring out from this passage of scripture. And it's that in verses 11, what we're going to see in David's prayer is that God is Wanting us to understand that there is permission for you to have joy in him. There is a principle for joy in him. And there is a promise for joy in Christ as well. Verse 11 says, but let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them sing. Let them be joyous. If you take refuge in me, God said, there's permission. Do you take refuge in Christ? Is your refuge in Christ? Yes, it is. I would assume that you would not be here if you had not accomplished that part. Re do I take, is my trust, do I find safety in the reality of God and his word found and seen in Christ Jesus. Well, you wouldn't be here if you didn't. The Bible says that there is no fellowship between life, light, and darkness. So to consistently come to the body of Christ, and not saying that that's 100%, but I would assume that to take, this is why we're here, because we do take refuge. We want to know what is on the mind of God. We want to come with the fellowship of the righteous and worship. We've had, me and my wife have had conversations over and over and over dealing with this whole consistency when it comes to the things of God and even when it comes to worship. And I said, and our, our, we're, we're in agreement that there's something about this sanctified time whereby everything that we do when we come together is focused in on Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but I, during the week, I don't know if I give two hours in a day to just focus in on Christ. So I appreciate that here there is this call to this temple, a call to fellowship with the body of Christ where the music, what's said, what's not said, hands are raised, whether I'm connected as I, as I want to be in that moment, I hear others that are connected that just really equip me and convince me like ah oh, man like it really helps me to worship God when I'm, a, I'm amongst the the people of God so this is why so I would say hmm is your if you, is your refuge in him check right you've trusted him you've done that part you've take re refuge in him by trusting that Christ is the only means by which we're going to stand before God justified 
Do you love Christ this morning? Are you trusting Christ this morning? And I would say, this is the body. We are here. Yes, we have. But I, I married my wife. Let's see. We were married on September 25th. And it was 2000, the year 2000. You, you should have seen the eyebrow she gave me. She was like, get it wrong. So that story between how we got married, like it was really off a whim. We were teenagers and right, just kind of out doing our thing. The Lord had saved us at this point. And just one morning I looked at her and I just said, hey, you know, it was a morning. Like, hey, why don't we get married this morning? And she was like. All right, cool. She had to be the work. <laughs> she worked at Captain D's, and we have so many memories behind Captain D's, and just because that was that was pre and post Christ, so just so many memories. She said, "All right, cool." So we went went to the courthouse. Still before a judge, we got married. Like her mom was furious because we didn't tell anybody. We just in that moment, we just said, man, this is right. And it was Christ pushing that decision because I went literally from not valuing women at all. Like I went from and I, I, I was in relationship with her, but I just didn't value women or that relationship. I was very narrow minded when it come, came to how I value what value I could see when it came to the female relationship. So God saved me and literally gave me a new mind. It was like he struck me with a Cupid's arrow, but I had been with her for some time. Like I saw her anew. I, it was just different. And we all know the experience of just being born again. The first birth didn't get it. It was when God filled me with his spirit that I was then able to see her for what she was to me. And I'm telling you, it was in that moment. I'm like, mouth dropped. You are a diamond. And, I, and, I, and I'm thinking to myself, like, Christ, if it were not for you, like, I would have lost this diamond. I literally have a diamond diamond by my side and I would have lost her and I praise Christ for that so that decision took a matter of minutes but how many of you know that being married the actual act of being married for 20 years is a lot different from a decision that's made in a moment right so yeah have we taken refuge in Christ yes you better believe we're here but there is a part where we have to be intentional that part of of grateful intention intentionalness grateful joy is an intentional effort every day that is ushered through a prayerful heart and that now when it comes to marriage every day We've been married now for almost 20 years. We've been together for 20 years. But every single day I wake up and when I pass her and she sleep, I think about her value to me. Like I have to think about how that because she is a diamond. But you guys know, man, it's hard out here. Right. When you're dealing with this mind, right, this mind on this earth it's you, the natural inclination is selfishness. The natural inclination of man. And I'm telling you, that don't wear off in 10, 15, 20, it don't wear off. It's a part of the human ailment. Man is fallen in sin where we just think about self. So Christ, just like I have to put on Christ daily, I have to every day remind myself. Now, I love her with all of my heart, but I'm telling you, there's a difference between this generic love and this sensation of value. To get that value gauge up, up, that takes intentional thinking in the mind it's not default so every day I walk past her and I think about like man I love her so much I think back and remember how far we've come and I do that daily every time I look at her, she knows sometimes I'm just staring at her of course she give that little smile like stop looking at me like she still do, does that to this day but when I'm looking at her I'm just thinking like God I thank you so much for this woman and this is after 20 years David said that he David said if for those who take refuge in me you've taken refuge but when it comes to joy in Christ that takes an intentional effort of you thinking about the value of Christ in your walk with him. That takes intentional effort of you really going and thinking back 
It's not just in the present moment, but it's thinking back as well. Like, God, look what you brought me through. Like, God, you might, you brought me. Like, my, my grandfather didn't have a whole lot of words, but he would just say, man, God has brought me a mighty long way. He's brought us from so far, and we have to think about those things whenever it is that joy is the thing that we're trying to access. Joy is hard sometimes to hold on to. And I know that there's a struggle because we think about, ah, there's always this, like, I don't feel like I deserve to be joyous. Like, I feel like if, if things are going well, if everything we look over our lives and we we'll say, oh, man, in all of these areas, things are good. Sometimes there's a, a fear that's, that resonates in our heart that we don't feel like we deserve to have joy. And we even get scared if, every, if, if too much is popping off and too, too many things are going well, we start to think like, oh, something bad has got to happen. Something bad has got to happen because this thing has been going good for so long and we actually find ourselves fighting. If we feel joy that came because things are popping off consistently, we'll fight against that and we'll create. We'll tell ourselves a story in our own mind just so we could just not be joyous. But the scriptures, he says, but let all those who rejoice, who put their trust in you, God has given you permission to have joy. God has given you permission because ultimately out of all of the things that could go wrong in your life, the one thing, the biggest problem that you do have is your relationship. The biggest problem that any man has is their relationship with God the Father. And as that is resolved, that's really the biggest problem you'll ever have, that now that we we are in right standing with God through the work of Christ Jesus problem solved. But then there's things that come daily. But God says, even in the scripture, he says, but let all those who rejoice, who put their trust in you, let them ever shout for joy. Why? So he says, so in this one big issue, he says that's resolved in Christ and saving faith in Christ. That's resolved. But even in the practical day to day, he says, because on a day to day basis, I want you to shout for joy because I'm defending you. So even as we walk out our faith day to day, we have a God that's in defense of us. So God has given us a permit and permission for us to have joy. Also, in these two scriptures, God has given us a principle for joy. There is a principle basis for joy. When we, was, we used to grow up, we used to call this a, a house getter. But we would say, I get joy when I think about what he's done for me. I get joy when I think about what he's done for me. Who, who knows that song? Who's ever sung that song? It said, I get joy when I think about what he's done so here in the text, he's promising to do these things to his body. He says in verse 11, I'm going to defend you. In verse 12, it says that he's going to bless the righteous with favor. He says, I'm going to surround him with a shield. How many has ever been felt protected by God? How, how many has ever felt like when it all had fell apart, when you had put your hands to it and it just fall, fell apart and there was nothing but God came and it was something that was outside of your control and, and the Lord came through right on time. How many has ever experienced that? Well, here it is in that song. He says, I get joy when I think about it. So then what's the what's the gap then? We're not thinking about it enough. We're not taking time to think about what he's done for us. So we thank God for these times where we come together and, and this is the purpose of our fellowship to think about. We got to be thinking about what God has done for me. There's a principle here, a command for joy that's rooted. So, you know, I, I man, I'm in education and, um, so and I work in an elementary school, just just like we're worshiping at. And there's a lot of things that can take your joy, right? Can make you <laughs> less than joyous. And not that joy looks because joy doesn't necessarily look like you're smiling teeth to teeth. Joy, I believe, is deeper than that. It's this contentment. 
it's this gratefulness that kind of threads through all of your day. And it, it sets the limit at f how far you will descend in your thinking, right? It set this, not that you won't dis dis um, experience any type of anxiety or what people call depression or experience that, but it sets a limit there because what's going to catch that is gratefulness for the things of God. But man, I, this, I spent this last year at a high needs urban campus. That's what it's called. We're Title I, high needs urban campus. So that means it's going down. Every single day from sun up to sun down, these kids are finding something to, you know, to just be into. So in that regard, you know, some people were in at our school and we're encouraging each other. But sometimes people say, you know, good morning. And I heard one teacher say to another teacher, what's so good about it? Like you're saying, good morning. What's good about it? Now, is it that from her perspective, there is it anything good? And from the other's perspective, that she only sees good, what's the difference between the two? Because there is goodness to be found every single day. There is goodness in every relationship, every smile, every time someone gives you a gracious touch, any word of encouragement. When a kid looks at you and he may not say the words, but you can just sense the appreciation. There is so much good in a day. So what's the difference between the two? She can't see it. She's not thinking about it. She refuses to think about the good things. She's stuck in this. But I've been there. How many have been there before? I've been there where I just couldn't see nothing good. Nothing that I could put my mind to was good. And it, it had me to, to sink into this deep hole. And so what's the encouragement in these two verses? That it's not like God is saying, put a smile on your face. He's saying, no, you should be joyful because. So the principle here is that he's not just telling you the principle of joy is that I'm not just saying good morning for the sake of good morning. No, I have been good to you. The, the scriptures say, and the backdrop, of course, is the gospel, but the scripture says that mercies are new every morning, every morning. Now, I don't know about you, but there's not a day that goes by that I don't look forward to the mercies to the next morning. There's not a day that I walk so circumspect that I'm just like new mercies. Uh, it don't matter. Like every day that I wake up to think that uh, I got a new slate. It, it makes me thankful and appreciative to God. So here it is that there is a principle for joy and it's connected, not just fleeting. It's not just this just, just rudimentary, just, hey, be joyous. It says because what he's done for you, what has he done for us? He's defended us. He blesses us. We have a God who blesses us. He's made us righteous when we were not righteous in our own ways. God has done these things. There's a principle for righteousness. And last but not least, in these two verses, we have a promise, a promise for joy. It says in verse 12 that those who love your name may exalt in you. That those who love your name, he's promising that the promise to you is that God promises joy to us as believers. And you should know that that's not just joy. It's not the end. It's the means and the end. Christ wants us to have joy. That's the beauty of our fellowship with him. That no matter what happens in life, no matter how dark the night gets, joy comes in the morning. That's the beauty of to know that we have a God that fights for us, that loves us, that's in touch with our infirmities. The scripture says that he is, the Holy Spirit is the paracletos. He walks alongside of us, that we're never lonely, that Christ is there with us through, through it all. And he promises that there is joy to be found in this walk. Light is sown. God is sowing light for those that love him. The Lord will turn every night. And you are going to experience, I've, I've experienced some dark nights 
I've experienced some spiritual warfare where I literally felt the satanic presence around me. And this is while I'm walking with Christ at my own hands. I've I brought about darkness in my own life. I've worked my hands and tried to with my righteous self doing this and doing that and failed miserably. I've had some dark nights, but in every night. Morning has always come because of Christ Jesus, because of the work that Christ, the hope that is found in this gospel and the, the hope that is found in God being able to take the worst circumstances and turn it around for his glory. God has brought day after day after day after day. He sows light for those that love him. I know y'all know. Um, I don't know where y'all came from, but Fred Hammond, what did he say? Fred, Fred Hammond said late in the midnight hour. God's going to turn it around and around late. That, that, and there's, there's something for you to hook a late that when it gets not just midnight, but when it seems like it's been midnight for a while, know that there is a God that, who controls. The scripture says he contro- the disciples was blown away. So who is this man that controls the winds and the waves? And, and you notice Christ's demeanor. He had a poise, a a, a resolution about himself. Why? Because in him was the answer. So what connects his confidence from ours? Trust that in him is the answer. In him is joy. And you may not experience it in the moment, but just know that as we prayerfully trust in God's word and his defense, God will turn that thing around. But let all, verse 11, let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy. Why? Because you defend him. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you. For you, O Lord, will bless. You have blessed. You are blessing the righteous. With favor, you will surround him as with a shield. Christ has given us in these two scriptures a permission. It's all right to have a little joy. It's all right to smile. It's all right to trust and relax. If you think back to the book of Hebrews chapter 13, it said, man, for the Jews, the That is a heavy theological text, but the baseline of Hebrews 13 is that out of all of these sects in history of Jewish experience, so many people fail to enter rest. There is a rest and there is a joy in Christ Jesus that is found in our prayerful trustfulness. Proverbs verse 3 and 6 says, in all things seek seek the lord we should be seeking god with everything that goes on in our life ups and downs no matter what it is we should be seeking seeking god psalms chapter 84 verse 11 there is no good thing that he will withhold for them that that christ loves no good thing so what is god saying don't be anxious we're so anxious about everything but god is saying don't be anxious Take rest, take joy in who I am. And in that same verse in Matthew chapter 6, that's verse 25, but in 26, he says, look at the birds. He says, I get it. Now, notice if God would give a command to his beloved children to not be anxious, that's him saying at the same time that he understands that's a reality of our walk, that sometimes anxiety rises because we're looking here, we're looking at this, and then we're, so many times we're thinking there's no way that the God of the cosmos and all of the things that he has to deal with, no, there's no way that this God has time for my little thing. Like, we, we know that the world is so vast. And we see God, and so we struggle with that. We say, man, there's no way that he can help me deal with my little thing. I used to think silly like that as well. 
But I thank God for helping me in those silly moments and those silly times where I get disturbed, scourged, and anxiety rises up in me. God says, think about the bird. And in that same verse, the heavy words come in verse 26. He says, they don't toil. He said, like the flower, the birds are not worrying. They don't get the heap in barns. They're not worrying about what's coming next. They're not, their anxiety is not connected to what they have and what they don't have. So what is he saying? They have a rest about them. And then those heavy words hit in verse 26. Yet your heavenly father feeds them and then he asks this question are you not more valuable than they and then time after time it dawns on me if if god can care for a sparrow if god can care for a bird surely god knows my uprising and my down setting and he loves me and it's okay and that's the encouragement that we give to each other because it's hard to hold on in it it's hard to hold on to that thinking that 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 feeling of joy it's hard it's hard to hold on but i thank god that in those anxious moments what does it do if it draws you to the feet of christ then you praise god for it if everything was so set for us if we could do it all so consistently if we never had any low points we would never we would never, just like the children of Israel. I don't know about you, when you read the Old Testament, I hope you see yourself in the children of Israel. Like, that's us all day. Man, things are popping. Well, you talking about January, February, March, income tax. We know income tax rolling around, but we all pop around here. Praise the Lord. Like, we all feeling good. Boy, there's a, there's a sense of joy, right? I know I feel it. I don't know if things be, be jumping around February, March, but we, me and Treasure just hugging each other. Like, we <laughs> walk around the house just... <laughs> just dance oh girl oh girl I see you right there's a joy but he says far beyond those moments if we would take our fears and our anxieties to the Lord in prayer the Bible says that David woke up and he prayed because he knew there is a battle in this mind. There is constantly things, whether it's from our marriages, whether it's from our relationships, whether it's from our jobs, whether it's from finances, whether it's from worry about what just might happen. Things are good, but we just in our minds like, oh, Lord, I just hope. And we will come up with the crazy, in the most peaceful solace of moments, we would just come up with the most craziest anxieties, but we are all prone to it. We got to trust Christ. We got to look to Christ because he is the remedy. He is the joy. God is giving you permission. He's saying he's giving you permission to take joy. And he's saying this is not just some whimsical permission. It's a principle that is founded on. The principle is, is that we have an act of God that is involved. And there is a promise. This is, there is a promise that God will inject light into your situations when there's dark. And then there's this ultimate universal promise that 2,000 years ago, God took on flesh. Our father sent Christ as a man to do what we could not do. Christ lived on this earth and he looked at that law, not just 10 commandments, but the whole 600 plus. And our God as a man fulfilled the righteous requirements of the law. He did something that we could never do. Because just like us, the people of God, when it came to the word, when they looked at the law, they saw it as something that they could achieve. And the Pharisees and Sadducees of this time and, and, and humanity as a whole always tried to run and please God from good works. And they soon found out that the law was never designed for you to be perfect and be able to fulfill it. It was designed to show you that if you think you were good in your own eyes, if you think that you are a good person in and of yourself, if you think that you've met my, my standard, here is my standard. Like this is my standard. And man was supposed to look at that law and say, if this is your standard of perfection, there is no way that I can fulfill this. I need mercy. 
It was designed to show you and cause you to throw yourself and cry out for mercy. Over 2,000 years ago, Christ came and fulfilled the righteous requirements of that law. Why did he do that? He did something we could never do. He did it so that his righteousness, the righteous requirement, could be imputed unto us. So that was Christ's act of obedience. He fulfilled the law and he imputed. He allows us to take part and participate and be covered by his righteousness, what he did and what we could never do. And then there's Christ's passive obedience because he imputed upon us his righteousness. But the penalty of our sin because of our disobedience was thrown upon Christ. You see a W invitation. Christ took on us everything that we could not do. And he died. And he bled. He was crucified. And he rose back up three days. And because we don't stand before each other, I don't stand up here as one who has it all together. I don't the me leading this conversation on what God wants is not because I got no any of the answers because And I would tell you, man, 20 years ago, I might have thought I had them. When I first came to Christ, I thought I had all the answers. I thought I was better. There was a self-righteousness that was kind of hidden. But man, Christ has, over my walk with him, he has, I fell so flat and miserably on my face. And he's shown me in those worst failures, one, that he would be there when I got up and offering to me in the worst moments when it seems like I couldn't I couldn't find it anywhere he's offering me forgiveness Christ died on our behalf so we we thank God the biggest the biggest promise that Christ gives us is that as we understand that at our best it's only Christ's righteousness gonna that's going to allow us to stand before God approved the Bible says to come and approach God with boldness well that boldness doesn't come in and of ourselves it comes because we've trusted Christ a good consistent God walking us through life people when they see us they see teenagers they see mothers and they see and 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 because we we're pushing God out we want to see so much strength in each other but really it's only weakness I hope you don't see a strong man I hope what you see before you today is a very weak man a beggar at best really just communicating to other beggars where I found bread. Man, God has raised this little boy and strengthened me and kept me. And I just pray that you guys are are encouraged. Our joy in Christ comes from our prayerful trust in what he's done. Believe that it's not in you, it's in Christ Jesus alone. Amen? Amen. Let's give God a, a hand clap of praise. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that you enjoyed that video. If you would like to see more, please visit our website at lifepointcc.org, where we are believing in God to have a life-changing message waiting for you.